The evolution of life on Earth, we can think of it as having a pattern and a process. So what's the pattern of the history of life on Earth? Well, the descent of life. First of all, evolutionary change explains the pattern. The history of life, when things happened, and classification life, how life is related. So we looked at these in the previous part of the course, and we can think of this as the what, the who, and the when of um, the history of life. But what we really didn't talk too much about is what the process was. What factors cause all these events to occur? So you can think of that as the why or the how. So in this second part of the course, we'll be looking more at the process or processes that lead to life changing over time that has resulted in this pattern that we talked about in the previous part of the course. So evolution by natural selection makes organisms better adapted to their environment. So we kind of know what this statement sort of means. But it's actually not quite so simple because we want to think a little bit about what actually is that environment that organisms are becoming adapted to. Lots of different things might exert selective pressure on organisms. You can imagine all sorts of things that might make organisms better or worse at surviving and reproducing. Like if we were to think about plants, maybe it's their ability to capture a lot of sunlight. Or thinking about animals, maybe it's their ability to hide from predators or maybe find the animals that are hiding from them if they are the predators. The environment is the rest of nature that organisms are dealing with, right? And that's not quite so simple because the environment is a very complicated thing. So we could think about something like this, right? The environment includes other species, so predators and prey, and it also includes members of the same species, right? So other individuals compete for mates or compete for food. A number of abiotic factors, right? Temperature, humidity, sunlight. And you could also even think of the environment as including internal factors, such as DNA mutation rates. Chemicals cause changes in the DNA. That's kind of like the environment that the genome has to deal with, and that's not really external, it's within the cells. You can think about the developmental process, so the process of development has noise and errors occur, that's an environment that those genes have to live in. And there's all sorts of other things, right? So the environment is very complex, very multifaceted. And then if we go back to this sentence here, okay, environment is complicated, but what do we mean by adapted? What is this phrase here really mean, or this term really mean. So what is an adaptation? So in your book, an adaptation is defined as a trait or integrated suite of traits that increases the fitness of its possessor. Um, it's called an adaptation, and it's said to be adaptive, right? So this is like a noun, and this is like an adjective. So there are two things missing from this definition that's given in the book. First of all, when it says increases fitness, we want to think about increases fitness relative to what? So what is the thing we want to maintain in our minds for context? Usually when we think about increased fitness, we think of it as relative to that of a hypothesized state without a trait. So an organism that has one of these adaptive traits, we're thinking about how is its fitness compared to an otherwise identical organism that doesn't have that particular trait or has like some other version of that particular trait. And then the second thing this definition doesn't really have is we want to really maintain a recognition of historical processes, right? So when we're thinking about adaptation occurring, adaptations have their current form due to the past, right? Because traits are inherited from ancestors. So we thought about this when we thought about homology and homologous traits. This is also in the Gould paper that you read in the previous part of the course where he talked about an adaptation and understanding the version of the trait in the ancestors was important for understanding that adaptation. So when we're thinking about adaptation, we also want to keep in mind there's this historical aspect. So adaptations have their current form due to the past, so we should always consider those traits in relation to the past. So if we're thinking about the hypothesized state without the trait, maybe the best thing to think about is what the previous version of the trait was in an ancestor that's otherwise identical, except for having maybe a new adaptation. So we can kind of memorize this definition, but we also want to keep in mind that this whole thing is a bit more complex, right? We want to keep in mind the context of fitness, and we want to keep in mind how history shapes adaptation. Okay, so let's look at an example. So this is an example you've thought about from the paper that you read in the previous part of the course. So here's a panda, and pandas are carnivores. You can see their, their teeth, although they eat bamboo, and you can see the panda kind of holding onto bamboo here. You can see 
the bones of the hand, right? So you've got the five real digits, and then you've got that sixth kind of pseudo digit that they can use to help hold on to this bamboo as they eat. So if we were to think about the adaptation of that sixth digit, okay, increases the fitness relative to what? So pandas with thumbs are presumably better than pandas that don't have those little thumbs, those six digit. And so we can see this because we can watch a panda eat and we can watch it use that six digit and we can realize that that panda is doing something that a five fingered panda without the little pseudo thumb probably couldn't do as well. So their fitness is increased relative to pandas that didn't have that trait. And then recognition of the historical processes Okay, that thumb is not an actual real digit, right? It's an enlarged radial sesamoid, a bone in the wrist. And the fact that it's that bone, that arises from historical processes, right? So the, the radial sesamoid is slightly enlarged in all bears. It's just even more enlarged in pandas. We can understand this adaptation, this sick digit, by understanding that the fitness is increased because having it allows them to eat better. And the reason that this is the particular structure of the trait arises from the history from their ancestors already having a slightly enlarged radial sesamoid. Although other bears don't have it enlarged enough to be kind of this pseudo finger and useful the way that pandas have it. But we could actually make up a story to fit all sorts of things. On the previous slide, there was a panda that was kind of yawning. Uh, here's a cat that's kind of yawning. And as I look at this, <sighs> Sorry. As I look at this picture of the cat here, this yawn kind of, kind of makes me want to yawn, and you may be um, wanting to yawn too, as I keep saying the word yawn and showing you pictures of animals that yawn. But if you think about it, there's something special about yawns. When I say the word yawn and show you pictures of animals yawning, you kind of at home listening to this might be wanting to yawn yourself, which is kind of weird, right? It's like a contagious behavior. So we could think, okay, yawns. So yawns, maybe they're a vestigial behavior from overt competitive displays, and that's why they're contagious, right? So when you see something yawning, or when you hear me yawn, like I did a minute ago, you yawn in response unconsciously because you have this aspect of your behavior which is trying to respond to that sort of threat. And so this is an explanation for why yawns are contagious, is we're kind of when an individual opens its mouth and shows its teeth, we feel compelled to do the same thing because in the past, individuals that did were able to kind of maintain their competitive aspect with other members, right? If they hadn't yawned, they would have been seen as submissive. By yawning and showing their teeth in response, they maintain social status. Or let's think about another trait for humans. So humans are relatively hairless, right? So if you look at humans around, we are all much less hairy than uh, chimps and gorillas, our closest relatives. So why are humans hairless? So one idea could be, well, humans are hairless because of male preference for less and less hairy females. So historically, everybody was hairy, but there were some females that had less hair than others. If males found that more attractive, they may have preferentially mated with those females or preferentially given them more food or protection. Those females uh, survived better, had more offspring. Their offspring had less hair because they genetically had less hair. And then those offspring would have had less hair than everybody else in the group and been preferred, et cetera, et cetera. And generation by generation, everybody ends up with less hair by selection for females with less hair. Or maybe humans are hairless because we evolved in Africa. And in Africa, it's really hot. And so maybe being in a really hot place, it's advantageous to have less hair. So again, back in the day, individuals um, would have varied in the amount of hair they had. And maybe individuals that had less hair, they didn't suffer from heat stroke quite as much. And maybe that's why we still have hair on the tops of our head, because that's where the sun really shines. But the rest of our body has a lot less hair, especially when we're standing up. Wind can go by and help cool us off. So why do humans have less hair than other animals? Well, it's because of selection based on attractiveness. Or it's because of selection based on the ability to withstand high temperature. Why are yawns contagious? Because we're like responding to competition, or our ancestors responded to competition. So these are all ideas. And at this point, when I'm just kind of making stuff up, I'm doing something that's sometimes referred to as coming up with a just-so story. So this comes from an author, Rudyard Kipling. He wrote a series of stories about how animals got to be the way they are by just making stuff up. So here's a story about why does the elephant have a long nose? Because he was drinking one day from the water, and the alligator came up and bit his nose, and they had a tug of war, 
and that stretched out the elephant's nose, and when he finally broke free, he had a long nose, and that's why elephants have long noses. Well, that's a kind of ridiculous, kind of childish story, right? But the phrase, just so stories, arises from this sort of idea. If we were trying to make up some sort of story for why an animal or a plant is the way it is, we could have some sort of idea. This is clearly a ridiculous idea. These are less ridiculous. But if we're going to do science, we need a way to test these. So we have some ideas. These are reasonable ideas. But like for these two, which of these two is the correct one? They both seem reasonable. How do we test those ideas? So this part of the course, the first thing we're going to do is think a bit about how to test different hypotheses that we have about adaptations. So we're going to use four methods to examine adaptations, to try to test them, right? So we're doing more than just telling just so stories, we're actually doing science. So there are four methods. The first is called the optimality observation method. So we'll look at natural variation in populations and see how different variants do compared to others. Second is the experimental method. We can actually set up experiments and see how possession of a certain trait influences the fitness of individuals with or without that trait. And then third, we can use a comparative method where we can compare different species, or maybe populations, but we can compare different groups that have different versions of a trait and statistically come up with evidence consistent with certain hypotheses. There's a fourth method, which is a theoretical or mathematical method. Um, we'll be doing that in the next part of the course. This is kind of population genetics and that sort of thing. But in this second part of the course, we'll be using these three different methods to study adaptation. And so when you use those three different methods to study evolution by natural selection, this whole approach to doing science is called the adaptationist program. So studying evolution by natural selection using these methods is called the adaptationist program, and that's what we'll be doing in this part of the course.